This conference will now be recorded. Hello, and today we are going to be talking about original Medicare uh, and a Medigap or Medicare supplement policy, selecting that option uh, versus selecting a Medicare Advantage uh, Part C plan. And this is a uh, going to be about an hour long. And this is uh, designed and geared towards those that are either transitioning onto Medicare or those that are already on Medicare and they're just confused. They're not really sure what to do or what uh, direction to go into. A um, couple of different disclaimers. Uh, number one, uh, the presenter, which is me, I am not affiliated with the, uh, CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, the United States government, any state or local government, VA, SHIP, or PACE. This course is not endorsed by any of the above. It is not intended to replace AHIP or any other uh, specific training. It is meant as a guideline only. Uh, the agent that you choose to work with is ultimately responsible for knowing all the rules and regulations. Uh, the presenter, which is me, I do not represent any insurance companies for the purpose of this training. And always, always, always refer to Medicare.gov or a licensed, certified, and appointed agent for guidance that is able to conduct business in the state of your legal residence. So let's kind of talk about um, the different parts of Medicare. Um, if you're already on Medicare, uh, you already know this. And if you're already transitioning to Medicare, I'm sure you've been getting a lot of information in the mail. But Medicare is essentially divided into four parts. Um, the two that, that will go along with one particular path, we're going to discuss. And uh, the first part is Part A. A is an apple. And it's often referred to uh, hospital. It's on your card in parentheses with the word hospital. Uh, and it just as you see here on your screen. And um, to kind of break it down, Part A is a zero cost to most people. Most people that have uh, put in their 40 hours worth of work and paid in the system, they're married to someone who did or have been declared disabled by the U.S. government and have been disabled for a period of 24 months. Secondly, uh, with the way Medicare works is you are responsible for, uh, and these are 2019 numbers, you are responsible for a $1,364 deductible and that's uh, once once per occurrence. And as long as the occurrence is inside of a window of 60 days, you would not be subject to two deductibles. However, if the occurrence is outside a window of 60 days, you would be responsible for uh, a second deductible if you are hospitalized. Um, after 60 days of hospitalization, you will have a daily copay uh, for the next 30 days, days 61 through 90, uh, for $341 per day. And then your lifetime reserve days, which are 60 of them, days numbers 91 through 150, the daily copay is double, $682 per day. After the 150th day, there is no hospital coverage by Medicare Part A. Additionally, Medicare Part A covers a skilled nursing facility um, they foot the bill for the first 20 days at a zero copay. And then starting on days number 121 and going all the way until day 100, you pay a daily copay of $170.50. And the rules are simple. A, uh, a skilled nursing facility stay to be covered by Medicare must follow a three-day hospitalization. And uh, for those of you that are wondering, what is a skilled nursing facility? It's also another name uh, to be told as a uh, rehab center. Uh, Part A only covers only covers an overnight stay in the hospital in a semi-private room, general nursing services, and meals. Okay, so I'll repeat: that's uh, only an overnight stay in a hospital, general nursing services, and meals. And then also under Part A, you have hospice and home health care. Uh, home health care following a hospital discharge, and it's not home health care like you would think. They do not come to your house and make you breakfast and lunch and clean your home and take you shopping. They come to your house to change your bandages, swap out your IV if necessary, and uh, essentially to make sure that um, you're not 
uh, in a situation where you need to be placed back into a facility. So it's not the home health care you're thinking about. It's just basically a home, uh, very briefly monitored skilled nursing facility. Everything that else happens to you medically, um, outside of sleeping in the hospital, eating in the hospital, and having a nurse come around and check your vitals, is all billed and paid for under Medicare Part B. B as in the fruit banana. And on your card, you'll have in parentheses medical. Sometimes people refer to this as the doctor part of their insurance. And this is not automatic. Um, you must opt in to uh, accepting Medicare Part B. And for most people, and I put um, that in there, for most people, uh, single people making under 95000 a year, joint people making under 170 for most people, the premium for 2019 is $135.50 per month. Comes right out of your Social Security check if you're receiving it. If you're not receiving Social Security, if you delayed it, you'll have to pay for it, whether it comes out of your bank account. Um, and I think they even take credit cards now. And uh, if you make above those amounts, um, I would encourage you to look up what IRMA is, I-R-M-A-A. -A. Um, if you make above those limits that I mentioned earlier, you will pay extra. You will pay more than the 135.50. You need to look up your own uh, and also speak with your CPA about that. The way Part B works is there is an annual one-time deductible for $185. Um, that starts in January, ends in December, end of the year, okay? And it's a one-shot deal. It's not a per-occurrence. It's not a per-service. It's a one-shot, one-time deal. After the deductible is met, Medicare will pay the first 80%, and then you pay the remaining 20%. So if the bill's $1,000 and you met the 185 deductible already, um, your share is $2. $100 and Medicare's share is $800, $80-20. Uh, uh, you pay the first three pints of blood if you require blood. Uh, Medicare picks up the fourth pint, pint going forward. Uh, we all know blood is pretty expensive um, in a hospital setting, depending on your blood type. Um, that could be as much as uh, $700 to $1,000 per pint. Also, there's what's called excess doctor charges. Um, if a doctor agrees to accept Medicare, but does not agree to accept Medicare assignment, in other words, the contract and rate that Medicare and the doctor have agreed to, in other words, the amount of money Medicare is willing to pay, to be fair, they do not agree to the assignment, Medicare says, no problem, we don't mind, you can charge more if you feel you're worth it, however, if you're going to take our patients, you're not allowed to charge more than 15%. So a doctor can charge in a facility um, up to 15% more of Medicare assignment. Now, where do we really see this? Uh, we're starting to see this a lot in hospitals. I know the, the I, should, I shouldn't say any of them, but there's a big hospital system in this country. Um, I know that doesn't, uh, that does charge excess charges. And we're starting to see it with a lot of doctors as well. Uh, Part B covers everything medically inside and outside the hospital. It's the best way to describe it. Everything medically inside and outside the hospital from fingertip to fingertip and head to toe. So everything that you could think of that can happen to you, to your body and your mind, um, that would be serviced, whether in a hospital setting, as an overnight inpatient, as an outpatient, or in a doctor setting, or in a freestanding clinic, or anything that has to do with medic medical, and these facilities take Medicare, it's going to cover. And then also Part B covers some medications. Um, most of the medications that they cover um, uh, are usually administered in a doctor's office, like an injectable. Um, also, chemotherapy uh, would be a good example of what would typically fall under a Medicare Part B uh, medication. So what happens now? There's really two paths that anybody going on to Medicare or anybody that's on Medicare, they have to decide. You know, it's a decision that must be made. And if no decision is made, one will be made for you in the sense that if you choose not to go with, let's say, the second path, which I'm going to describe, you're going to be defaulted to the first. So 
Path number one is where you are entitled to Medicare Part A and you opt into Medicare Part B. So what you do is you remain with original Medicare. So for people that stay with A and B and that's where their claims are paid and that's the card they use, that's their insurance company, that's their network. Medicare is the insurance company, Medicare is the network. Big confusion in our industry. When you're on Medicare, Medicare is your insurance company. It's the only insurance company that is networked when you're on regular Medicare. And you decide to purchase a Medicare supplement policy, which is also called Medigap. A Medicare supplement policy is only a silent follower to Medicare. It has no powers. It is not your network. You do not have to find doctors that will accept your Medigap policy. You have to find doctors that will accept your Medicare. And so if you purchase a Medicare supplement policy from a private insurance company, you also must enroll in a Part D to cover your medicines. And we're gonna dig into that in just a minute. The second path is where you're entitled to Medicare Part A, and you opt into Medicare Part B, so you gotta do either for either path. But here, what you do is you decide to turn over your Medicare benefits to a private insurance company that has a contract with Medicare. So I'm gonna repeat that. You're still gonna be part of Medicare, but you're saying to Medicare, you know what? I don't want you to pay my claims. I don't want your benefits. I don't wanna to go to your doctors. I want to go across the street to private insurance company XYZ. I want them to give me my Medicare benefits. So Medicare has a contract with an insurance company and the two must haves that has to occur in that plan is number one, that insurance company must offer benefits equal to or greater than original Medicare. Most of them offer benefits better than Medicare but they have to be at least equal to. And then secondly, this is very important, they must have a stop loss, which is also known as the maximum amount of spending that you can have in one year for medical services. In other words, a maximum cost in any given year, no matter what happens to you medically. Now, these are the two paths. We're gonna start with path number one, and we're gonna explain it in, in very great detail. But first, I wanted to talk about um, what we have perceived, and again, this is not the rule, but we have perceived of who would be a typical Medicare supplement client or prospect. Um, if you're watching this video, you're probably in a situation where you need to make a decision. And oftentimes, when you, when you know about the kind of person that you are and where you fall into line, it will help you make that decision. And really the, the, the classic typical buyer of path number one, the person who's gonna choose that path, is somebody who wants predictable healthcare costs. Very, very important. They wanna start January 1 of every single calendar year, and they wanna know precisely what they're going to be paying for healthcare. Precisely, exactly, to the penny. No surprises. Number two, somebody who does not want to be told where they can go and where they can't go. They don't want to be told that they can go here and they don't want to be turned down when they try to go there. They want no network restrictions. They want to have the luxury to see any doctor anywhere in the United States of America at any time without a referral. So let me repeat that. They want predictable healthcare costs. They want no network restrictions and they wanna be able to see any doctor anywhere in the US at any time without a referral. And additionally, they also would like no co-pays, no deductibles, and I put, a, I put an asterisk there because um, I'll explain when we get to the different type of uh, Medicare supplement plans on the next slide that the um, only two plans that uh, pay for, or in other words, don't have a deductible are going away. So I have to put a star there because technically you can still buy those plans today. But for somebody that doesn't want co-pays, deductibles, and cost share, has resources to support about 
150 to $200 a month premium uh, on top of, and I apologize for the typo, uh, 2019, on top of $135.50 per month to Medicare. And where, where I came up with this figure is I took an average plan G, which we'll dig into in just a minute, um, a, an average Part D premium, and then an average uh, premium for a dental, vision, and hearing plan, which is extremely popular amongst people that buy uh, Medicare supplement plans. And on average, I came up with about $150 to $200. Depending on where you live in the country, that may be more or less. So just to recap, somebody who wants predictable health care costs, somebody who has uh, no desire to be uh, in a network restrictive capacity, they want to see any doctor anywhere, they're willing to pay for that. They're willing to pay for that. You put all this together and you have the typical Medicare supplement client. Additionally, if you are a heavy utilizer of services, if you know in your heart that you're terribly sick and you're chronic and you're constantly utilizing services, you will do better in a Medicare supplement plan. And if you are a snowbird um, or a traveler, traveler whether it be domestic or foreign, you will do better in a Medicare supplement policy, okay? So there are 10 different Medicare supplement policies. Um, they are alphabetized between the letters A and they skip through all the way to the letter N. Um, the two most commonly chosen ones today are down the center, Plan F as in Frank and Plan G as in Gary. However, um, in just about 13 months, the Plan F is going to be discontinued. Um, if you already own one, you'll get to keep it. But uh, if you already own one, you know how high the rates have gone up. Your rates will go up much faster than the next plan, which is the plan G. G is in the color green. So G is going to be replacing the F, and G is going to be the most popular going forward, and it should be the most popular today. Uh, the second most popular is all the way on the right, the letter N as in Nancy. And if you take a look on the left, um, all the benefits have been outlined for you. And if you take a look, you can see uh, what Medicare pays for and what your risk is. I put that in black. And then the red check marks will show you that if you purchase a Medigap plan, and we'll just kind of focus on the plan G, um, it will pay for your Medicare Part A uh, coinsurance and hospital costs. Uh, it'll pay up to 365 days. If you remember, Medicare stops at day 150. So this will continue for a full year of hospitalization. It'll pay your Part B coinsurance, the 20%. It'll pay the first three pints of blood. It'll pay hospice care coinsurance. It'll pay the skilled nursing uh, facility care through day 100. It will pay the Medicare Part A deductible, 1364 per occurrence. It'll pay them, uh, it won't pay the Medicare Part B deductible, and it'll pay the Medicare Part B excess charges of 15%. So uh, when the people pair together a Medicare uh, Part A and Part B, and they pair it with a Medicare supplement plan, whether it be the F or the G, uh, when you really look at it, if they chose the G, the only thing that they have to, have to come out of pocket um, in the given calendar year is that $185 deductible. So kind of going back to the previous slide here, it's somebody that wants no co-pays, no deductibles, and no cost share, okay? Very small deductible if you pick the G. The people that pick the N, um, they do take a little bit more financial risk. Um, if you take a look down here, Plan N covers the Part B coinsurance, except for $20 office co-pays and $50 emergency room co-pays. So if you have a Plan N, you pay the first 185, and then after that, you pay $20 office co-pays. Um, pricing difference between a G and an N is about $20 a month. So if you know in your heart of hearts that you are not the kind of person that's going to go to a doctor every month, you may want to look at the N for a better economic value. If you know in your heart of hearts, if you are the kind of person that's going to go to more times than a doctor once a month, um, or you don't want to be in a, a risky situation in the future, where you are going to see a lot of doctors, then for a minor difference in price, about $20 or $25, the G would be a better economic value for you. I would absolutely caution you to stay away from the Plan F. 
Plan Fs are going away. Plan F rate increases are greater than any other plan. And plan Fs are not a better economic value to G. And what I mean is when you take a plan F premium and you pair it to a plan G, it's going to be more than, the premium is going to be more than that $185 annual deductible price difference. It's going to be four or five or $600 a year more. It is not worth it. Stay away from it. I know I said I wasn't going to give any advice on this particular uh uh, module, but uh, quite frankly, I, I can't. I can't help myself. Just absolutely stay away from the Plan F. So, some more information about original Medicare and a Medigap. Um, there really is only one risk, the way I see it, and the risk is is the premium increases each year. Okay, so depending on your state, you may be subject to two increases each year, uh, and this would be what they call an attained age um, state. And that is where there's an age increase. In other words, every single year that you get older, it's written into your policy. Um, your rates will go up typically one to 3%. Um, and that's something you know ahead of time. So when you're selecting a plan, you wanna make um, sure that you understand how your age rate increases are going to work. Some go up faster and more than others. And then secondly, what is called the community rate increase. They take a look at claims and they decide that everybody in the state of Georgia or the state of Wyoming um, is going to experience a rate increase. It's not um, discriminatory in any way. It's just every single policyholder uh, will receive that increase. And most insurance companies declare um, a community rate increase about once a year. Some of them do very well where they don't have to declare it. Um, that's certainly a risk. So you really got to make sure you work with an agent that can look at uh, a particular insurance company's rate history increases and help you make some decisions. Um, overall, the rate increases can be as low as about 1% to 2% a year and high as about 10 to 12 They tend to fall within those parameters. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's always best to work with an agent um, that can uh, help you uh, give you insight. The number one rule you must follow, this is the most important thing, number one rule, this is the biggest confusion in Medicare when people have a supplement, is the only rule that has to happen is that the doctor or the facility that you choose to use must accept Medicare. If they have agreed to accept Medicare, they must accept your Medicare supplement no matter who it is, no matter where you get it from, no matter what alphabet letter you have. Your health plan is not your supplement. Your health plan is Medicare. Your supplement has no powers. It has no decisions. All it is is a secondary payer to Medicare, nothing more. Doctors cannot choose which Medicare supplement to accept. They are not given that luxury. Clients all the time, we explain this to them, and at the end of our presentation, they'll say, well, I need to go ask my doctor if he will take the insurance company you recommended. Of course, absolutely he will, or absolutely she will. If they take Medicare, those are the rules. It's written into the Medicare and You book. It's on Medicare's website. Doctors cannot select Medigap policies. They have to take everyone that has Medicare if they accept Medicare. It's that simple. All alphabet letters work the same. This is another good one. Uh, this is why I love this industry. All alphabet letters work the same. So what that means is a plan G is a plan G no matter where you get it from. A plan N is a plan N if multiple insurance companies offer the same letter the benefits are exactly the same. So if insurance company XYZ offers a plan N and insurance company ABC offers a plan N, the only differences between those two plans is the price that you pay for it today and the future rate increases. The benefits are identical. Every insurance company that offers these alphabet letter plans, these are the benefits. They are identical. And then finally, this one's very important um, if, you're, if you're new to Medicare. Um, if you don't pick up a Medigap plan when you're first eligible uh, and your eligibility runs uh, six months before and after you turn 65 or when you go on Part B, sometimes that's the same time for most people. 
But uh, if you don't pick up the Medigap plan when you're first eligible, you may never able to you may never be able to get it once again due to medical underwriting. Um, they're guaranteed to be issue issued up to age 65 and a half or six months past your Part B effective date. So um, you're eligible to get a Medicare supplement plan um, with no medical underwriting questions. You happen to be one of the unfortunate individuals that uh, suffer chronic uh, chronic illness. Uh, COPD, for example, um, and you're on oxygen, as sad as that is, and you opt not to take a Medicare supplement policy, and you pass that guarantee uh, issue uh, moment, you'll never be able to get one again. You'll never have that opportunity for the rest of your life unless a unique anomaly happens, but you'll never be able to get in uh, to a Medicare supplement. So it's very, very important to weigh that into your decisions. Um, additionally, um, if you if you go path number one, uh, what you will also have to select is a Medicare Part D plan. This conference so, will now be recorded. So when um, going Medicare and Medicare supplement, you also have to pick up a Part D. And uh, in short, um, in order to have a Part D, you must have Part A or Part B, one or the other. In the previous um, slides, you need to have both. Uh, with the D, you need to have one or the other. Um, you must select it at the time of first eligibility, or there might be a late enrollment penalty assessed uh, down the road if you ever need it again. And the way that you need to understand that is the penalty is 1% per month for every month that you went without it, and that would be assessed according to the national average PD plan. Um, I don't have that information readily available, but it's about $38 a month, which is the national plan, maybe 36. So if you waited two years, um, to not get a PDP, um, your penalty would be 24% against that national average plan, which works out to be about $8.60 per month for the rest of your life. Uh, some PDP plans have deductibles, some do not. You got to look at your particular county or your particular state and see what's available on Medicare.gov. Um, for 2019, the Part D is divided into four stages. Um, the first stage is the deductible stage, which is $415. Um, once you go through the deductible stage, um, Medicare has set up a virtual bank for you, uh, equal to $3,820. And even though you pay co-pays uh, during this stage for your medicine, some of them will be for free if they're generics, uh, name brands will have co-pays. Um, the full cost of the drug is deducted from this virtual bank. Once this virtual bank is expired, you go into the next stage, which is the um, coverage gap, also known as the donut hole, even though they said they're phasing it out. Um, but when you go into the donut hole, um, you pay a percentage of the medication. Uh, the, pharma the pharmaceutical company pays a percentage, um, and the health plan pays a percentage. And together, um, uh, once you spend uh, at your own pocket $5,100, uh, then you go into catastrophic, and catastrophic is where you don't pay more than 340 or 840 for your medicines, 15% uh, for the more specialty stuff. Um, we can do a little bit more deeper training on Part D. Um, this does not affect a whole lot of people, uh, but yet it does. If you're on a handful of medicines and they're expensive, you're going to want to really get with an agent that can really help you understand the Part D. Uh, premiums range from about $10 a month. Um, to over $100 a month, and it varies by region. Um, they adhere to what are called drug formularies. Most of them have five tiers. The first two tiers are generics, preferred and non-preferred. The next two tiers are name brands, preferred and non-preferred name brands. And then the, four, the fifth tier are specialty. And, and it's just basically how they price medicine. Um, and they vary. So for one, in, one insurance company's Part D, they may have... I don't know, uh, metformin as a, as a tier one, but at another insurance company, they may list that same drug metformin as a tier two. Pricing is very different. So um, there's no rhyme or reason. It's just how the, the market goes, the, the commodity of the medications per uh, plan. Um, oftentimes, switching to mail order is going to be less expensive than buying at a retail location. We look at a lot of these different plans, and I can tell you I see once the person switches to mail order, their medic, a lot of their medications are free. And then finally, the plans are over. They're, they're offered by private insurance companies, but overseen by 
um, CMS. CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Now, moving on uh, to path number two, uh, who is going to be the typical Medicare Advantage buyer? So um, usually pricing is what's going to force somebody um, into a Medicare Advantage plan. And I don't mean it in a negative way, um, but it is usually about money. A lot of our decisions in life are financially backed, but um, for the most part, is somebody who cannot afford a Medicare supplement and a Part D together, uh, low-income households, and I put a little asterisk there, um, and I'll just read that off real quick. There are financial subsidies that are available by Social Security in your state, and it is based upon income and asset qualifying households. And, you know, to even consider whether or not you're even eligible, um, if you're married and your incomes are um, under $3,000 a month, um, just to kind of give you an idea, and if you're single and your incomes are under $2,000 a month, it is worth your time to explore the financial subsidies. It doesn't mean that you'll be approved because of the guidelines, but it is worth your exploration. Secondly, somebody who uses the VA, our veterans, thank you for your service, many of you. Uh, you have all done your job so that we can sleep peacefully at night in this country. If you use the VA, you can go into a Medicare Advantage plan, typically at no cost. A lot of them are offered at zero premium. You can still use your VA doctors, but now you have access to this whole world of civilian doctors. Um, when we come across people from the VA, we get excited because we know we got a good solution for them um, that won't cost them a whole heck of a lot of money. Uh, somebody that has Medicaid in addition to Medicare, Medicaid in addition to Medicare, um, agents are prohibited from selling you a Medicare supplement plan. There are special plans that are designed uh, in the Medicare Advantage market specifically for what are called dual special needs, DSNP, people that have Medicare and Medicaid. Um, if you cannot be underwritten for a Medicare supplement, you don't have one, but you want it, but your health tells you you can't get it, um, you are left with only one option, and that is to go and get a Medicare Advantage. Um, if you have certain conditions, and I don't know if I have this even listed here, but I should, but if you have certain conditions, uh, such as diabetes, COPD, heart disease, uh, there may be a chronic condition special needs plan, a CSNP uh, plan available in your area that is designed specifically for people like you with your conditions. Somebody who can afford a Medicare supplement, but the premium cost plus the Part D plus the dental, vision, and hearing is greater than the Medicare Advantage prescription drug maximum out of pocket, thus rendering it not economical. So if you remember what I said earlier, one of the things a Medicare Advantage plan must have is they must have a maximum out of pocket spending, a stop loss. Oftentimes, a, and, and depending on the market that you're in, the Medicare supplement premiums plus the add-ons, the D and the dental, vision, and hearing, when you add that together for the calendar year, it becomes greater than the maximum out-of-pocket risk in some of those Medicare Advantage plans. So especially when you look at markets like Florida or Minnesota, uh, we see it in California, Connecticut, New York, big expensive markets, sometimes economically it does, make, it does not make sense to buy a SUP. It makes more sense to go in an Advantage plan and pay as you go. Uh, somebody who is not a heavy utilizer, or hardly at all, but recognizes they need something. Uh, somebody who does not want to pay a high monthly premium for health care. So in my first example is somebody who cannot pay. And this example is somebody who does not want to pay. Uh, somebody who is comfortable with a pay-as-you-go platform, whereas the Medicare supplement is a predictable cost platform. The Medicare Advantage is unpredictable. You pay as you go. And then somebody who wants an all-in-one plan. They don't want to hand a Medicare card. They don't want to hand out a Medicare supplement card. They don't want to hand out a Part D card. They don't want to hand out a dental, vision, and hearing card. They want to just hand one card. They want simplicity. Okay, these are all the types of people that will uh, benefit in a Medicare Advantage. So um, there are two, two main types of Medicare Advantage plans. We're going to look at both of them. Um, there are some others, but um, in most markets, for most people, uh, they generally tend to lean towards uh, what's called an HMO, 
which is a health maintenance organization, and in the next slide, a PPO, a preferred provider organization. So let's look at the differences. Uh, first and foremost, with an HMO, uh, there are two kinds, the main one and what's called a POS, a point of sale, or an OA, open access. Uh, with a health maintenance organization, um, you are required to select a PCP. If you do not have one, one will be provided for you. In order to see specialists, you must get a referral from your PCP. You are only able to use plan doctors, doctors that accept your HMO. Uh, in exchange for this, in exchange for this managed care platform, you are going to be paying the lowest copays and the lowest cost sharing for your health and for your prescriptions. Uh, and additionally, you will also receive uh, the richest extra benefits, uh, which are generally broken into dental, vision, hearing, transportation, over-the-counter money. Uh, some of the plans will give you some money throughout the year, a couple hundred dollars, upwards of five or six hundred dollars to spend in a uh, pharmacy uh, setting. And then uh, some HMOs have what's called a Part B give back. This is really good for our lesser resourceful clientele that do not meet the criteria for financial subsidy. Um, this will return some or all of your Medicare Part B premium. Um, most of the plans that have a Part B give back um, generally give back between 50 and upwards of $100 of that Part B. Um, HMOs, for the most part, have prescription drugs included at no additional charge. And then I um, uh, did mention it a second time here that they may also offer a Part B give back. Uh, the one thing that I didn't put here is, for the most part, again, depending on what area you're in, but in most areas, HMOs are zero premium plans, in most areas. The HMO POS or OA, uh, again, POS is the point of sale. Uh, OA is open access. Um, with an HMO POS, um, it is where you are required to use plan doctors for the services outlined in their summary of benefits, but they do offer some out-of-network benefits where you can go and use uh, any doctor you want, the point of sale, um, usually for specialties and, and things like that, where the HMO is not able to contract locally for that type of stuff. And then what's called OA, OA is open access. And open access means that um, there is no uh, primary care physician referral required. You can just go see specialists without that referral, but you do gotta stay in the network. Um, the two insurance companies I listed there, they're generally, you know, the, the main players for the POSs and the open accesses. And then uh, prescription drug coverage is typically included. The next type of plan um, is what's called a PPO. And a PPO stands for a preferred provider organization. And over the years, the trend has been, there's been greater advancements and um, emphasis put on the HMOs because managed care is a better value proposition to both the insurer as well as the beneficiary. And there's been less emphasis on the PPOs. PPOs are tend, they, they are required in the marketplace, um, but they do fit a specific type of uh, individual. And with the PPO plan, um, it's very flexible. There is no PCP required. Uh, you don't have to get referrals to see specialists. You can use plan doctors at a lower cost, um, or you can use any doctor at a higher cost. So a couple of things you need to be cognizant about um, if you are going to use out-of-network doctors. It does not mean that your out-of-network doctor that you go see will build the health plan directly on your behalf. They may require you to pay their fees, and then you submit the claim to the health plan uh, for reimbursement. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You can see any doctor, but it doesn't mean that the doctor will bill for you. Um, higher copays are typical with PPOs and cost sharing uh, versus an HMO. Uh, again, not the rule, but it's just generally speaking. Um, for the most part, the extra benefits are not very rich, and oftentimes there are none included at all. Um, we see in certain areas where there would be no premium for an HMO, we would see there being a premium for a PPO. Um, a lot of them don't have premiums, but sometimes we would see that. And then um, what they started doing a couple of years ago is they started using uh, deductibles in the plan to uh, deter people from 
going out of the network. So they've incorporated, uh, some of them have, not all of them, an added network deductible, and I've seen it as low as 500 and as high as 1,000. And then finally, with PPOs, um, RX is, is included, but there are some PPO plans that do not have prescription drug coverage. When would we use that? We would use that for our VA uh, benefits. So uh, one thing I want to kind of jump into a little bit is what are the risks of a Medicare Advantage, where before I talked about what are the risks of a Medicare supplement, um, just to recap, the only risk of a Medicare supplement is, is financial risk. The premium that you pay today is going to be different than the premium you're going to pay tomorrow. You just need to be cognizant that you go with an insurance company that has a bit of a more uh, ethical way, or I shouldn't say ethical, but they, they make their rate increases with integrity. And it's very important um, you go with a, with a plan. In other words, you don't want to follow the herd. That's the main thing. You don't want to follow the herd. If every agent is recommending insurance company XYZ, that means they're sticking everybody in there. And not just the healthy people, I mean, just everybody. You don't want to follow the herd. That's the key to the Medicare supplement uh, selection. Uh, the risks of Medicare Advantage. Um, number one risk is your doctor can leave the network at any time and you can't follow them. These are one-year contracts. So if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan and it's February and your doctor quits, well, you need to find a new doctor. It's that simple. Or if you want to follow your doctor, you will be paying that doctor's fees out of pocket unless you have a PPO plan, and then it would be the out-of-network uh, cost sharing. Uh, getting into what I just said a second ago, most people cannot change their plan during the year. You will have to wait into the annual election period, and the annual election period runs from October 15th through December 7th. However, also starting in year 2019, they're doing um, an open enrollment period from January 1st to March 31st, for the people that made a mistake or didn't get a chance to change, if you already have a Medicare Advantage plan, they're going to give you one shot to change it. Uh, the plans change from year to year. Uh, what that means is that the beautiful, wonderful, um, attractive copays that you are enjoying this year may not necessarily be the same for next year or even exist at all uh, because they do change from one year to the next. Uh, they can be discontinued at any time. I would tell you on average, our office gets about a dozen calls a year of people that get letters from their plans that just decided they weren't going to do it anymore. They just dis discontinued and they're left having to find uh, a plan. You pay for all of your services uh, as you go, as you use them. Um, for some people, this is a great deal. Uh, for other people, this can be extremely costly. And we're going to look at some examples. And then, um, the plan's network may be scarce and the specialist may be far away between 30 and 60 miles from you. Uh, we have clients all over the country and oftentimes we look, look at some of these provider networks and the client asks us about particular doctor specialties and we look and then we, we look at the distance from their zip code and in many cases it's 40 miles or 50 miles. So that's one of the risks that you have with these plans is the fact that they will have specialists, but the specialists may be far away. How do you decide? And it's one of the hardest questions to, to answer in this industry, is how to decide. Um, the way that we look at it is oftentimes it's about money. Um, if you have the resources to pay a monthly premium for a Medigap, you, re you really can't get any better coverage than that, especially if you select a Plan G. 100% coverage after an annual $185 deductible you can go anywhere, anytime, for any reason, and the costs will always be covered as long as they accept Medicare. How do you beat that? You can't beat full coverage. There's no better coverage than full coverage. If um, uh, financially, monthly premium is a bit difficult, um, certainly look into a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, you need to understand what your restrictions are and what your risks are involved. If it makes sense to select a plan and your doctors will accept it and your medications are covered and priced within your budget, that's awesome because that's exactly what, the way that we would help you choose the plan. We always work backwards. It goes medications, doctors, then we pick the plan. And then economically being mindful and then understand the restrictions and limitations. That's the main thing I'm saying it a lot of different times, a lot of different ways. You want to look at it not just short term, but you also want to look at it long term. If you feel that you rather have a pay-as-you-go plan, then a Medicare Advantage plan is right for you. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a case, a, a very uh, a case study. Pick this the random conference county. will now be recorded.
very random, uh, zip code 23173, Richmond City uh, County, Virginia. Uh, I'm on the East Coast, so I just tried to pick something in the middle point. Um, and I just went with a default female age 65 non-tobacco. And here we're going to look at the uh, differences in pricing for different services for someone that um, picked an original Medicare and a Medigap Plan G, uh, whether they went with a Medicare Advantage HMO and a Medicare Advantage PPO. And I just picked a random one uh, that was available in the county. I think there was a total of eight Medicare Advantage plans. And uh, we're original in Medicare, uh, as well as the Medicare Advantage HMO and PPO, everybody's got to pay the 135.50 Par P premium. That doesn't change. Um, with the uh, uh, Medigap decision, the pricing range, and I looked very quickly uh, for the monthly premium, ranges between $84.77 a month to $128.58. And there was about 20 different insurance companies in that range. 20 insurance companies charging different pricing for the exact same thing. So naturally, I'm not going to say you're always going to want to go with the lesser costing option because cheaper isn't always better, but you can certainly decide and find a plan uh, with an insurance company uh, based on you know history and claims paying ability and all that other fun stuff, more towards the lower end pricing of the spectrum as opposed to the higher end pricing of the spectrum. Um, the prescription drug plans that were available on Medicare.gov and the zip code and county for 2019, the price range was between $14.50 per month to $93.30. Again, uh, your specific drugs are going to determine which plan will be best for you. Uh, but I can tell you this, um, analyzing you know well over a thousand of these things a year, uh, for the most part, people tend to fall towards the lower end pricing spectrum uh, under $40 is, is normally what I see. Uh, max out of pocket is $185. And then we kind of go through the different services. Uh, Medicare Advantage HMO, uh, there is no monthly premium, if you can look in the middle. There's a max out of pocket of $3,400. And the PPO happens to have a premium of $53. Um, there's no additional RX, it's built into that premium of $53. And if you take a look there, the maximum out of pocket is a little bit higher uh, $6,700 for in network and 10,000 for out of network. So let's just look at some of the some of the services. Uh, primary care and specialist visits are zero uh, for the Medicap buyer, because remember, they don't pay for anything as long as they pay the premiums. Um, in the HMO, it's free. So if you go see your specialist, uh, I'm sorry, your, your primary care physician, it would be a zero copay. In a PPO, it's a little bit more, it's $10, a little bit more. In the specialist for the HMO, it's 35. For the PPO, it's 40. If you're hospitalized in the HMO, if you bring your eyes up a little bit higher, uh, the copay per day for hospital is 300, and you will pay that for five days. After the fifth day, the plan will pick up the hospital fee. If you are confined to the hospital for the Medicare Advantage, it's $5 a day less, but you're responsible for one more day versus the HMO. Uh, urgent care, $20 for uh, the HMO, $40 for the PPO. Um, skilled nursing facility, if you take a look there, it's more expensive on the PPO. Um, this particular HMO did have some value-added benefits. Um, it had a gym membership included, meals and things like that, rides to your doctors. Um, you do require a referral, and there are network restrictions, because remember, health maintenance organization, you need a referral. Uh, the PPO did not have any value-added benefits. Um, of course, there's no referral needed, uh, and there was no network restrictions. Uh, the HMO did have some vision and hearing, um, and there are some HMOs that do have dental. Um, this particular PPO only had hearing. It did not have vision, did not have dental. So if you wanted vision or dental with the PPO, you'd have to buy a separate plan. And then the moving back to the left, original Medicare with Medigap and a Plan G, uh, there is there was no coverage for hearing, dental, and vision. You'll always have to buy a separate plan for that. So this should give you a good example on how the pricing structure works between the three. And then on the next slide, I did a few scenarios. So um, Medicare cost sample case study, and I do want to emphasize these are just examples. So scenario number one is the applicant is relatively healthy and attends a wellness visit each year. 
Uh, they take one medication for cholesterol and they get a bi they get biannual checkups, which the doctor does um, full blood panels, lipids and whatnot. Uh, for this particular individual, typical Medicare Advantage annual costs are going to be under $100 for the entire year. Why? Where did I come up with that number? So preventative visits are for free. You can't really say free, but preventative visits are zero copays in HMOs and PPOs. And this particular individual uh, gets a preventative. This particular individual that I described goes to the doctor once or twice a year and it's either gonna be zero or $10, and they get some lab work. Lab services are gonna be either zero or zero to 45. So I just gave an average that this person is gonna spend no, no more than $100 for the entire year on all these medical services. And if they pick the HMO, they would have a zero premium. So their entire Medicare medical out-of-pocket costs would be what they pay Medicare, which is what everybody pays, and if they had the PPO, it would be $53 a month. If they went with original Medicare and Medigap, they would have the premiums, you know, $120, $150 a month. But they wouldn't have that out of pocket. Scenario number two is a moderate utilizer, somebody who has heart problems under control, diabetes are under control. Uh, sadly, they tend to go hand in hand. Diabetics tend to have... Uh, heart problems, high blood pressure, tends to go hand in hand. Uh, they see two specialists two to three times a year. They see the endocrinologist, um, and they also see the uh, uh, cardiologist. Extensive heart tests annually. Uh, sometimes they get out of control. This person may have one to two emergency scares per year, which drives them into the emergency room. Uh, typical Medicare Advantage annual cost about $600 for the whole year. And if you go back to the last slide, um, you can kind of see where I came up with this figure. Um, when you have specialist co-pays, that can be either $35 or $40, and they're going a handful of times through the year for each specialist, uh, and maybe an emergency room visit at maybe $90 or $100, uh, we're coming at about $600 for the entire year. Uh, somebody that is in scenario number three, uh, broken hip. Uh, they had to go in for surgery. They were hospitalized for five days, three weeks of physical therapy, uh, which are 18 sessions in total, uh, six months of follow-up visits. Um, and I kind of broke down the typical cost, hospital stay of 1,770. They maxed out on the co-pays, uh, physical therapy of 360, durable, durable medical equipment of about $100, walker or cane and then uh, PCP and specialist visits, uh, approximately $400. So in that example, the total out-of-pocket in a Medicare Advantage plan would be about $2,500. In all three of these scenarios, if you had a Medigap Plan G, the maximum cost would not have exceeded the $185 deductible that you would pay for the entire calendar year. So scenario one, two, and three, you're paying as you go. If you were to go with a Medicare, uh, original Medicare and a Medicare supplement, the only thing you would pay is $185. Now, I could have done a scenario number four, and I could have done a you know heart uh, surgery and major, major, major stuff where the bill would be hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the person would max out on their max amount of pocket. Or if they were diagnosed with cancer, uh, cancer, I can tell you, you will absolutely.